yeah, you're, you're all very welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't yet know me, I'm Gerardo Sulawan. I'm head of the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning here in MTU Cork. So uh, thank you all for coming along. I, I can see people are still joining us, but we've a, we've a nice number here already, uh, enough hopefully to have a bit of discussion uh, later on. And a very special welcome again to staff joining us from what is now uh, MTU Kerry or just MTU. Uh, great to have you along. So following on from Catherine Cronin's talk last week, we have another guest speaker for you today, Dr. Uh, Donna Lantlow. No pressure, Donna. Um, this is a different kind of talk in a way because myself and uh, Tom Farley, who you will hear from in a minute, uh, have been working with Donna for a while now on a project uh, funded through the um, MTU office which I suppose was initially set up to look at teaching and digital teaching practices in general, but then became something different when the pandemic came along and we all moved to um, emergency remote teaching. So a lot of Donna's talk today is gonna to revolve around this research work and the really interesting themes that emerged from it. And for me, I think it serves as another example of the kind of work that Donna does in her research, was, which is to bring a lot of value and insight into the lived experience of, of staff and students as they engage and try to navigate the whole world of the digital. Um, so before I finish, we're using Zoom webinar today, which is a slightly different system from normal Zoom. If you have a question that you'd like us to pose to Donna later on, please uh, use the Q&A feature to do that, and I can field those questions later. Equally, though, I, I think Donna's very open, and we can um, you can use the chat facility or you can get on the mic um, when, when the presentation is finished, and hopefully we can uh, we can all have a bit of a chat then. So we're up to 31 participants, which isn't bad. Um, Tom, do you want to say um, anything by way of introduction or, or context or add anything further? Uh, just to say, I suppose, and you, you said a lot of it there, as I said, I suppose no one foresaw the, the pandemic which overtook it. But I think one of the things there that, as I said, it's a, a for me, the research about giving people a voice because I suppose people have been faced with enormous challenges and I suppose just to, to feel that, that that voice is being captured. And I think if anybody's going to do it is is Donna. Um, uh, for anybody who hasn't come across Donna or her work before, you're certainly in for a treat. And um, she has strong core connections as well, which she um, no doubt sort of mentioned. But uh, no, simply to say it, it's great to be part of this uh, project with uh, Garod and Donna. And as I said, for me, the strength here is telling the story. So. Over to you, Donna. Thank you both. Thank you so much for having me. And it is uh, delightful to see we're up to 34 participants now. Um, so I wanted to, to make it clear um, that I'm an anthropologist. And so I'm coming at approaches to um, not just education technology, but education overall um, as my field site. Uh, so if, um, Traditionally, anthropologists study um, people in faraway places from the anthropologist. If, if we traditionally have studied villages and, and things like that, um, education, uh, higher and further education, is the village that I study. I started off uh, studying in libraries and it became very quickly, uh, very clear that I needed to study the context in which uh, academic libraries were situated. And I, and I feel that way about approaches to um, digital in education generally. It's not enough to look at the specific institutional context, but you need to look at the, the much broader picture in which people are situated. And that was sort of um, the reason that uh, Tom and Garod wanted to, to bring me in to think about this. Um, early on in our conversations, it was clear that the proposal for the new MTU um, was being solicited and, and wanted it to be evidence-based, wanted it to be, the, these are the things that are happening at the then CIT and ITT. Um, and these are, these are the things that already exist. Um, one of the things that happens to me um, as somebody who's brought in as a consultant is that I'm often told by people who bring me in, uh, we don't think anybody's doing anything in X. 
So we want to teach them how to do X. And what I inevitably find is that people are already doing X. And what we need to do is, is surface the practice so that we can talk about what's working, what's missing, and what we would like to happen next. So Tom and Garod were very confident that there was already very good practice, both at ITT and CIT around digital and teaching. And so one of my jobs was to simply talk to people about what they were already doing so that that knowledge of good practice could then inform the formation of uh, MTU. And then as, as both Garod and Tom said, the pandemic happened. So we were planning to do uh, the interview-based fieldwork um, in the spring. Uh, we ended up doing it in the summer because everything was an emergency. And so uh, the sorts of things that I was um, asking people, and I am moving over to where my interview questions are, um, were very broad-based questions. What is the work that you do? Um, how do you do that work? Walk me through a typical day. Um, and of course, we had to talk about how that has changed. So one of the things um, that happened both at ITT and CIT was the, the move to remote teaching. And again, depending on which program people were teaching in, uh, happened for the most part after um, a lot of the coursework had been done. So people were sort of catching up um, and doing things remotely, but they had had a foundation of being in classrooms, in labs, in physical spaces with their students that they could build on for their online um, experiences. And so we also talked about what people thought might happen in the future. And at that point, the future was what is now last fall. Um, and I think that, that one of the things that we thought at the time was that fall of 2020, autumn of 2020 was going to somehow be better in terms of the virus and it wasn't. So I think one of the things about this work, even though we did it in 2020, a lot of the things that people expressed, a lot of the concerns that people had uh, remain relevant because not as much has changed from July of 2020 to now as we thought it would, unfortunately, uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, certainly. Um, so, so that's, that's the larger context. Um, and so it was an interview based project where I asked people about their practices. Um, I talked to folks both at CIT, um, and ITT and across a range of disciplines. So we were trying to learn from people, um, from media studies, from, uh, hospitality, from, um, agriculture, from, from a wide range of of the disciplines that are that are in the institutions. And again, the idea was to be grounded in what people were doing and what worked for them and what their priorities were based on what they've already been doing. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the sort of themes that emerged uh, from the conversations that I had with people and uh, some of the implications that I think are emerging from those themes. And then we can have a conversation about uh, what people think is right <laughs> and what else needs to be done. So the first theme I wanna talk about is, is the notion that support um, or help is not the same thing as guidance. So the people I talked to referred to um, all of the tabs that they had open on their browsers that they knew they needed to, to read or that contained videos that they needed to watch that gave them guidance to do something online with their class or to configure a resource or to think about planning what they were gonna do for their students. But what they needed was someone to sit with them while they actively reworked an assignment or part of their syllabus or a module. Um, and what they actually experienced is helpful uh, was in the context of a, a trusted relationship. So if they had a pre-existing connection with colleagues who they knew were good at online, um, they would reach out to them, even if it wasn't that person's job to, to help people doing things in digital places. So I think there's a couple of things there. I think that um, there are always a lot of good materials out there that people could access to help themselves. And I think particularly in an emergency situation, the idea that people would help themselves is, is a problem. 
Um, and I think that institutions and people working in institutions need to think a lot more about how can we actively help and support people rather than provide them with guidance and then sort of send them on their way. Um, and I think this is true for students as well as staff. Uh, it's not enough for us to post a list of resources and say, now we've helped you. Uh, sometimes it needs to be much more hands-on than that, um, certainly to, to be experienced as help. Um, and I, I don't think this is a pandemic emergency exclusive issue. I think this is something that has always been the case, but I think it's acutely visible um, in this particular situation. A related theme is uh, around resources and, and just sort of how available they are. And this includes uh, technical resources as well as um, just information ones. So a lot of the people that I spoke with we're not entirely clear about what was available to them. And it varied, it varied depending on what uh, department they were in. It varied uh, depending on what location they were at. Some people were closer or further away from the resources that I knew were available to them uh, should they need them. Um, and I think that the reorganization that has followed the formation of MTU has already put in place more mechanisms to make that sort of thing visible. But I think it's worth thinking about um, how are we making visible who is available to, to offer help uh, and to, to help do the work, to extend the capacity of staff uh, in their teaching uh, and, in, and in the roles that they have in their departments. And, and what I saw in talking to people was that some confidence came not necessarily in knowing what to do, but in knowing who to whom they could speak if they were unsure or if things went wrong. So it wasn't even that people had expectations that they would already know all the things, but if they were confident that they knew who they could go to, then that sort of uh, facilitated them being willing to maybe take more chances or um, maybe just try something that was unfamiliar simply because they knew it needed to be done and they knew they would be supported. Um, the other implication of resources isn't just in an institutional, what do I need to teach? What do my students need to learn? Uh, but also about resources to live. So, so we had conversations about um, where these people lived. Did they have a, a room away from the rest of their household to work in? Um, do they have caregiving responsibilities? So the conditions in which people teach and learn are embodied. Uh, we are not disassociated spirits. So even as we're working in, in digital places, even as I'm talking to you on Zoom, I am sitting in a room in my house. I am lucky enough to have a door that I can close. I am lucky enough to have a machine that I get to use without worrying about who needs to use it next. And these are some of the things that, again, not just staff, but students are struggling with. And it's related to the next theme that I wanna talk about, which is um, technology and equipment, which is a very specific kind of resource, but one that carries with it questions about who is responsible. So when everybody was on site, it was very clear who was responsible. The institution was responsible for providing the broadband, the machines, the equipment. Um, if everyone's teaching at home, who provides the equipment? So several of the staff, I think all of the staff that I spoke to were very clear that um, if they asked for equipment, they got it. Some of them needed headphones. A lot of people needed uh, laptops, but questions about connections aren't just about what the institution can provide, but are also about what's available in the community. So if you, live somewhere that doesn't have access to broadband. I, I remember speaking uh, to one member of staff in particular who said to me during our interview, if I lived across the road, we would not be able to have this conversation because I would not have broadband because it doesn't extend across the road where I live. And there were many staff who thought very wistfully of the equipment they could be using if they had access to the physical campuses uh, in Cork and, and in Tralee. So I think it's important 
going forward to think about the implications, uh, not just for MTU, but for the community that, that you're responsible to, to the, to the people in the communities that uh, surround and are a part of um, MTU itself. Um, how could local governments, for example, partner with the technological university to uh, lift all boats? What if uh, MTU started to have conversations about what much more broad responsibilities we have as an institution to think about connectivity and uh, technology resources in the community, not just for the purposes of the MTU, uh, but for the purposes of the community. So another thing that came out of the conversations that we had um, were questions around effective teaching. So I asked people, um, what's your approach to teaching? Uh, what does that look like? Um, who do you get support from when you're teaching? And it, it ended up being an exploration around questions like, what, what is lecturing right now? How is it different from, from when you were in a, a physical room with your students? Um, what does conversation look like when you have to do it uh, on screens or if, if your students can't even, don't even have a camera and all you are is, is voices to each other? Um, and so I think thinking about how do we support staff, teaching staff in doing effective teaching without endless Zoom calls? So, so being zoomed out is already a cliche. Um, and the fact is that, that in the late spring and even through the fall, video conferencing became sort of the easiest thing for people to slide into, to feel like they were still connected to each other and to their students. But we know that, that it's exhausting on a number of levels. It's emotionally exhausting, it's physically exhausting. It's very bandwidth heavy. And I think that people do need, again, support um, from people who know more, from people like in, in the TEL unit, for instance, uh, about what else this kind of teaching could look like. Um, so thinking about where that support could happen in terms of expanding people's notions of what effective teaching, not just effective teaching online, because the idea that, that lecturing um, is one of the only ways to deliver content is something that I think has been troubled for a while. And at places like um, MTU, there's a lot of practice-based education and we need to think also about what that means and what that looks like. What are the processes that happen when you are in a physical room with your students and doing things? What could that look like online and how can we use that facility, the online facility to expand access um, in a way that we probably always should have done, but now know that we particularly need to, to be capable of doing. Um, another major theme that came out very strongly was, was a sense of isolation. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, it was already very strong in the summer. I think if I redid these interviews now, it would be almost unbearably <laughs> intense, the sense of isolation from peers, but also um, the sense of, of isolation from their students. I did ask them how they think students are doing. And some of them said, I really don't know. I don't have a good way of being in touch with them. Um, I deliver uh, the classes. And, and again, I was talking to them in the summertime. And so there was a sense that, that people had disappeared that um, people were apart from each other. And even if we're apart from each other for good reasons to keep people safe, um, even with technology, people are alone and they're lonely. Um, the fact is that some of this isolation did predate the pandemic emergency. Um, and I'm thinking very particularly in, in professional contexts, but also possibly personal. Um, there are people who brought in to teach just one course maybe over from another department. So they'll be, they'll be seconded to um, a department that isn't their home department to just teach, teach one piece. 
of something um, or who they might only teach on on one particular part of a module and, and don't ever interact with their colleagues who are teaching on another part. Um, and that wasn't uniform. So the ways that people experienced isolation in their teaching uh, varied from department to department. But I think if we look at the pre-existing isolation that people were feeling around, I teach this one thing, I don't know what my colleagues are teaching, I don't know how what I'm teaching is connected to what's being taught in the rest of the department. Um, I think that there are useful conversations to have around how to build connections that mitigate that sense of isolation. Um, that could also have an impact on pandemic caused isolation, but that can also have an impact on the teaching and learning experiences of people at MTU. What would it mean for students, for staff to have a more holistic sense of what's being delivered across the department? Uh, what would it mean for staff to have that holistic sense then when they're thinking about what else might be possible? So we need to think about the ways uh, that people need to go through their teaching journeys, right? It, it's possible that people might know what they want to do and why they want to do it, but they don't know how. Maybe they know how to deliver something online, but haven't really thought about why they might want to do it that way. And I spoke to people who knew very well what they needed to teach their students or what they wanted their students to learn, but they weren't confident about how to do that online. And even if they were doing it online, uh, they weren't confident that what they were doing was effective. There, there was a lack of a feedback loop um, and there was an intense anxiety in the part of some lecturers that maybe they were doing things wrong. And then there were people who knew how to do things online really well but weren't so sure about the instructional design that would allow them to apply that knowledge of sort of being online to teaching very specifically. So they, they weren't so sure about the, the transferable skills. And I also talked to people who knew why they wanted a particular approach in terms of, I want my students to be able to talk to each other, or I want my students to be able to um, engage with this content, um, but again, they weren't sure how to translate what they knew it would look like in the classroom to what it would look like online. So I think in thinking, again, going forward about how to help people, I think that there's something there around getting a handle on the what and the how and the why that people have in their practices. I think these can be decoupled. And I think that if you have a group of people who are trying to sort this out, you might have a group of people who, who have maybe one or two of those things settled in their minds, but maybe not everything. If they work together, they can help fill in each other's gaps. And I know that there are, for instance, communities of practice that have been set up and that were set up before um, the pandemic emergency. And I think those sorts of models are, are worth thinking about in, um, continuing to support people and also expanding the structures of support throughout the new MTU. If you had a group of people together and some of them were really confident about the what and some of them were really confident about the how and some of them were really confident about the why, collectively, that's going to inform really effective teaching and learning practice across the institution. And I saw an example of, of how powerful that can be in some of the people I, I was speaking to. There were at least a couple of staff members who habitually team taught pre-pandemic. Um, they shared their teaching uh, across a module. They were never um, isolated in their teaching practice. And they clearly felt more confident about what they were doing online, I think in part because they weren't teaching in isolation. They always had a partner to talk to about what they were doing when they were doing it. And that's something that predated the pandemic emergency. Um, I did encounter some people who were confident in isolation about their practices, but they were 
a lot less expressive about why they were doing what they were doing. It was just how they had done things and it, it seemed to be going fine and they, they didn't question it too much. So I want us to think a little bit, or maybe a lot, um, about people who already had very online practices um, because they were teaching students who needed to be online for access. And a lot of the conversations that I had over the project, this was initially framed as international students. Uh, so you have entirely online master's programs, for instance, and the target audience is imagined to be international students. Um, but at least one of the people I interviewed found out <laughs> as she was teaching one of the online MAs and was expecting to have students from across the globe and more than half of them were from the surrounding county. Um, and what happened was because it was entirely online, a bunch of local people who would not otherwise have been able to access the course if it had only been offered in physical locations got to be on the course. So there are elements already in MTU practice from CIT and ITT that help meet the needs, not just of the pandemic emergency, but of the larger and already evident need of students for whom physical presence might be a barrier to access. And, and there are already department and unit cultures that encourage and build uh, team approaches to teaching and curriculum design. And that can really mitigate some of the isolation effects that surfaced in, in the research that we were doing. And as I said, communities of practice also played a part if people could find them. Not everybody thought that they had access to one and some of the people I talked to were really self-contained. I'm just gonna pause for a drink. So I wanna talk a little bit about the implications and then I will stop talking. <laughs> so I think that, I was really struck by um, the combination of fear and lack of confidence that so many people who were doing the work, who were self-evidently teaching online and being with their students online and who still were very anxious, not just about what they had done in the spring, but what they were going to do in the fall. And I think that has probably continued into, into this spring. Um, and there were a lot of questions about what kind of support they and their students were gonna get from the institution. And also, of course, how conditions in the world outside of the university will shape their options. Will we even be able to go into buildings? Um, how am I going to uh, build relationships with students if I can't be in a room with them? Uh, what are we going to do with first years who don't already have a relationship with us? So there was a, a deep recognition for the need for a continuing development of their own practices and student practices. And I think that there was a real question about how can they support students in developing digital practices if they don't know how to uh, find a place to, to develop and support their own practices. So I think this research really requires us to ask, what does innovation look like at MTU? Um, how do people in leadership positions talk about innovation? Uh, what do the people teaching think of innovation? Uh, is it something new? Is it technology? Um, and I think it's worth asking, what would provide space for MTU's vision to be a different kind of university, one that provides greater access to a wider range of students in a more accessible range of, of spaces, both, both digital and physical. And certainly prior to the pandemic emergency, the digital learning teams um, at both locations had largely been supporting people um, in supplementing their teaching with digital. There, there were some fully online teaching and learning happening, but not at the scale of the entire institution. And the challenge of moving everyone online in, the, in this emergency, um, even though we have done that work, um, and even though a great deal of work has been done in thinking about crafting digital experiences for students and instructors, um, 
there's still a lot more work to do. I think that uh, the response to the pandemic emergency has to be and has been a lot more than just technical reactions. Networks and expertise were already in place to help people sort of rapidly convert their practices, even if they knew it wasn't perfect, even if they were worried that maybe there was more they could do. Um, I think you do get to say that the emergency provided um, an unforeseen stress test. And I think it's a test in which um, everyone passed. And so now we get to, to look and see what worked and see what else uh, we would like to happen next. Because I, I do think that core to my impression anyway, of, of what's core to the new MTU and its approach is, is the notion of access access for the community to education, um, access to the resources of the institution, access to the expertise of the staff. And um, I know in, in our conversations, uh, there was one point where Tom pointed out that the physical presence of MTU is, is scattered from y'all to Bally David. So online tools and places and practices are gonna have to be key to widening and maintaining access to and across MTU. So current practitioners who are confident in online context are gonna be key to developing an institutional culture across MTU. And I think it's gonna to have to center the role of digital in creating effective and creative opportunities for education in the community. There's no way that you're going to be able to get rid of the incredibly important role that digital is going to have to continue to play going forward. And I, I think that one of the things that our project has demonstrated is that people who are already engaged online for access reasons were willing to expand their online practices and to think experimentally about what digital learning could be like. So we're not starting from scratch here. Think about how those individuals can be identified, supported, and connected to their peers as a resource for CPD? How can MTU build on existing good practice and connect it across the institution so that these pockets of excellence and expertise can inform the entire organization rather than remaining local in their little departments? And I think there are challenges uh, in figuring out the processes and the structures that, that are required for, for that kind of institutionalization of, of practice. Staff who are willing to experiment don't know when you ask them how that experimentation would fit into the current requirements of their work. Um, how do I carve that time out when I'm also doing all of these other things? And I, I think this is somewhere where um, one current location for the work of digital innovation rather than putting it onto any given individual uh, member of teaching staff is the, the current TEL and um, EDSU, <coughs> excuse me, teams at in Cork and in Tralee. Um, and I think this is the, the same place where people go when they have the capacity to ask for help to get assistance with the basics of teaching and being online. Um, and our data suggests that currently people go to the center for one thing or the other, but maybe not both. So there will be people who just ask for help with the basics and there will be people who just ask for help with experimentation, but they're not necessarily the same group of people. So thinking about how can we get capacity from the center to provide space for both and maybe to offer space for both. Um, because currently the space for thinking about new or different ways to do things um, tends to only be available if it's carved out in the summer months or funded by outside grants. And so what would it look like for the new MTU to provide space and time and resources both for basics and for imagining what's not currently possible? So I think that um, I'm going to stop there, but I, I want to think when we're thinking about institutional practices as an anthropologist, it's, it's always my default to then think, well, what else is out in the world that's informing that? And I think that thinking critically, not just about the things that we observed on the ground um, in Cork and Tralee, 
but also the, the sort of wider context of community, of the global pandemic, of the things that people didn't have control over, like whether or not they had access to bro broadband and what the institutional response needs to be or could be. So in working to ensure access um, for the immediate sort of stakeholders of students and staff. MTU, of, of course, is playing an important role. Um, but in working to ensure that access, you're also playing an important role in advocating for the wider community to have access to digital infrastructure and resources. And, and so then I have even more questions that I can't even answer. Um, could MTU allow schools to use the VLE? and other accounts. Historically, the physical estate at both ITT and CIT were made available to schools and other parts of the community. So what would it look like to allow access to the digital estate? Um, and I think that starting to find answers to these questions and, and generating questions like this could be a really interesting way forward for MTU um, in its new identity as a regional university with a very strong mandate to serve the community. And I'm going to stop there. Well, thank you so much, uh, Donna, in case I don't get the chance to say it. Thank you for such a, a deep and wide ranging, but also local and grounded talk uh, about what's going on for staff at the moment and, and the various different themes uh, emerging from the interviews that you uh, conducted. Uh, there was so much that chimed for me, at least there so much to ask about and take up in terms of helping people, expanding structures of support, the role of taking risks, the importance of community, and um, the way in which we have to work together to cover off what you've called the, the what, the how, and the why of our digital teaching practice. And, and obviously a lot to be asked then in terms of the role of all of that in MTU and the post COVID, or at least the post vaccine, um, experience, but uh, good also, I think, to hear that while there is uh, work to do, there is stuff that we as staff are doing well that we can uh, that we can build on.